Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for the story of Route 1 in Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. Author Susan Bregman is going to give a presentation based on her brand new book, Along Route 1. And so a little bit about Susan. Uh, she's the author of Arcadia Publishing's New England Neon and New England Candlepin Bowling. I think Susan presented New England Neon here in person pre-COVID, and uh, we had her present on Candlepin Bowling uh, a couple years ago on Zoom. Uh, a native New Yorker, Susan moved to Boston after graduating from college and never left. The remarkable photographs in her book uh, come from historical societies, museums, libraries, universities, and private collections. Uh, again, want to thank the Friends of the Library, the Corning Foundation, and uh, the 15 libraries that helped promote the program. So all 250 of us who are watching live and the many more that will watch the recording on demand, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Susan for joining us here tonight. And Susan, you can take it away. Thanks so much. All righty. Thank you, Robert. Great introduction. Um, this, I want to say, is the inaugural presentation about Along Route One. The book came out last month, and um, I am thrilled to be here for the third time. So thank you for inviting me back. So let me... Ah, there we go. So this is how Route One started. You can see on the left, highways used to have names, not numbers. Um, they were the Atlantic Highway, the Jefferson Highway, the Lincoln Highway, and the result was just a confusing jumble. So in the 1920s, the U.S. Bureau of Public Roads stepped in and introduced a numbering scheme. In very simplified terms, north-south roads ended in odd numbers and east-west roads ended in even numbers. And they have stuck to that numbering scheme even through the um, era of the interstate highway. So that's what happened in 1926. So just to get some of these numbers out of the way, US 1 was designated officially on November 11th, 1926. Fort, Ma Fort Kent in Maine was the Northern terminus and Miami, Florida was the original Southern terminus. The road was extended to Key West sometime in the 30s when um, automobile access was available. And much of Route 1 incorporated the old Atlantic Coast Highway. I have a recent but unofficial estimate of the mileage of Route 1 from AASHTO, which stands for the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. And they, um, they checked in with 15 departments of transportation on behalf of me and um, estimate that the route is currently 2,391 miles long. So we'll just say 2,400 miles. It's the longest north-south road in the United States and it passes through 14 states and the District of Columbia. Northern New England, Maine, New Hampshire and Massachusetts account for about 26% of that mileage. Maine has 526 miles, so it has the vast majority of Route 1 miles in New England, and in fact, is only second to Florida in terms of total mileage. New Hampshire only has a small piece of seacoast, as we know, so it only has 17 miles of Route 1, and Massachusetts has 86 miles. So the US Department of Agriculture, which used to oversee the nation's highways, called Route 1 a highway of history when it was established. And they wrote this about the road almost 100 years ago. They said, United States Route Number 1 is a highway of history. The motorist traveling the road today is reminded frequently of the life and customs of the early days by the old inns, which have survived the passage of time and which now boast, in many cases with truth, of having sheltered the father of, the country, of his country. But Route 1 also documents a changing America, changes in the way we travel, do business, and play. So let me talk about that a little bit. So in the late 1800s, before Route 1 was a glimmer in anyone's eye, electric trolleys provided critical transportation connections for work and play in the communities along Route 1. This streetcar 
operated between Biddeford and Old Orchard Beach in Maine. Looking at this airplane, this airplane is the yellow bird. And um, after Charles Lindbergh made his successful transatlantic flight in 1927, others tried to replicate his success. And a lot of these flights took off from Old Orchard Beach, although not all of them succeeded. The Yellow Bird did succeed. It was a French plane. And um, they even had a stowaway aboard, which was quite a surprise to the crew of three when they were out over the Atlantic. Um, the 1929 flight did land in Spain and the crew made its triumphant appearance in Paris. And the plane is still on view in Paris at the Le Bourget airport. But Route 1 is really associated with the growth in automobile travel in the first half of the 20th century. Here, this is a filling station in Ellsworth, Maine at the intersection of routes one and three. Three is the road that takes you to Bar Harbor. And um, you know, the service attendants provided, um, you know, took care of the cars and the drivers got to relax in the tea room that you can see in the background. So it was sort of like a rest stop on the pike, but you know, nicer. So even the Roosevelt stopped there. They, they popped up a lot on Route 1, especially Eleanor traveling to and from the family retreat on Campobello Island. And that balloon, that balloon is the Double Eagle II, which successfully completed the first crewed transatlantic balloon flight in 1978 between Presque Isle in Maine and somewhere in France. In the early days of travel on Route 1, rich people traveled by steamship and railroad, and they stayed at elegant hotels like the Samoset here, the um, one in the top left. And you can see them playing croquet on the front lawn. Um, regular people, they just camped out in fields. Hotels were also built in cities like this um, Hotel Rockland, and they were there to accommodate the um, non-croquet set. Um, the Rock Hotel Rockland, boasted the most beautiful cocktail lounge on the coast of Maine, but sadly it burned down before I had a chance to check that out. But as auto travel began to grow, tourist courts like the lower left here began to pop up along Route 1 to offer an affordable but bare bones option for road trippers. And then someone figured out that it was more efficient to consolidate all those cottages into a single structure and suddenly motels started to um, line Route 1. And um, of course, eventually independent motels were replaced by and large by chain operators. And this motel I believe was in um, Caribou, Caribou, Maine. So Route 1 also had room for small family owned businesses as well as for massive factories. On the top left here, this is Bertha and Percy Moody. They opened three tourist cabins in Waldoboro, Maine in 1927, and then they added a lunch wagon. Today, a fourth generation of the Moody family still runs Moody's Diner and Moody's Motel and Cabins. And this in fact is my Moody's coffee mug. In the upper right, that's um, Violet and Ken Cormier. Um, they transformed a drive-in restaurant in, in Saco into Funtown, Splashtown, USA. The family still owns that amusement park and Violet is still involved in day-to-day -day operations. Below, you see some of the textile mills in Biddeford. Um, the uh, mill complex in Biddeford and Saco along the Saco River was once one of the largest mill districts in the country and employed as many as 9,000 workers. Today, the mills are gone but the complex is on the National Register and many of the buildings have been converted into other uses. Route one, oops, there we go. Route one is also home to theaters, arcades, bowling alleys, skating, skating rinks and amusement parks. Here on the left is the Grand, which is a lovingly restored Art Deco theater in Ellsworth, Maine. And on the right, this is the original neon sign for Bolarama in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which is one of several candle pin bowling houses on Route 1. And I'm pretty sure by now I've bowled at each one of them. 
But most of all, I think we all consider Route One an unapologetic mix of history, pop culture, and pure kitschiness. On the top left there, that's, um, that's in Perry, Maine. That's the granite marker for the 45th um, parallel, the point halfway between the equator and the North Pole. On the right is wild blueberry land. It's part museum, part amusement park, and it's devoted to the wild blueberry, which is one of the few berries that are native to North America. And on the lower left there, that's a still from Peyton Place, the 1957 Lana Turner movie, which was filmed in Camden, Maine, and some of the communities around it, including Belfast. Um, the movie was based on a novel that was considered so scandalous in its day that producers had a hard time finding a New England town willing to host the film crew because the book was set in a fictional, um, I believe, New Hampshire town. Um, and libraries would not include the book in their collections. In the interest of research, I watched the movie. And, um, you know, looking at it through today's lens, it's, it's practically a Hallmark movie, but I get it. Um, and a fun fact, Lana Turner was the only cast member who did not film her scenes on location. She stayed in Hollywood. So let's talk about Massachusetts. And you can't talk about Route 1 in Massachusetts without talking about the Hilltop Steakhouse. The restaurant was built in 1961. And it really is a New Englander's vision of the Wild West, complete with fiberglass cattle out front, dining rooms with names like Santa Fe and Kansas City, and of course, that cactus, that neon cactus. By the 1980s, the Hilltop was the busiest restaurant in the US. But Frank Jafrida sold the place in 1988 and it kind of went downhill after that and Hilltop closed in 2013. The cactus has been refurbished and I use air quotes because, you know, they stripped out the neon, they took Frank's name off and um, it's just kind of not, not the same anymore, but it's been integrated into the new development on the site. So at least it's there. Um, Kowloon, across Route 1, also in Saugus. Kowloon has a similar story, but at least for now, Kowloon is still open. In 1958, Madeline and William Wong bought a modest restaurant and they gradually turned it into a 1200 seat restaurant and entertainment complex. A 30 foot tiki god greets customers at the front door. Dining rooms have names like Volcano Bay and pretty much everyone from Jerry Seinfeld to Frankie Avalon have played that showroom. The family still operates Kowloon but they've announced their plans to sell the property for redevelopment. And they're saying there's gonna be a smaller version of the restaurant incorporated on the site. So stay tuned for that. There was a Mr. Peanut sign on Route 1 outside a planter's peanut store in Peabody. Um, and then the peanut shop closed in the 60s and the half dollar bar moved in and they turned Mr. Peanut into a man wearing a tuxedo. Um, the bar closed about 20 years later in the 80s and planter's peanuts swooped in, rescued the sign, restored it, and placed it on display at its plant in Fort Smith, Arkansas. Fern's Motel is in Saugus. It opened in the early 1950s and was demolished in 2015. And like a lot of motels along Route 1, that's kind of the only story I have about them. I don't really know any other details. I know that the plastic sign that replaced this neon number is still standing, last I checked, um, but it's covered with graffiti and the motel itself is gone. So Walt, the Red Wing Diner in Walpole is a diner with a secret. Um, outside, it's just an unassuming white clabbered building. Um, but if you walk inside, you're walking into a 1930s era original Worcester lunch car with original details. And you can see here the mosaic floor. And you can see a little piece of the barrel ceiling there. 
Um, what happened was when it opened, it was just a diner, but the owners kept adding on over the years. And then they sort of eventually put siding on the outside. And um, today, the lunch car part serves as the bar for the restaurant. And then, of course, we all know the orange dinosaur. The Route 1 miniature golf and batting cages opened on Route 1 in Saugus in 1958 and closed, I don't know, maybe in 2015, I think 2016. Um, but luckily for all of us, the orange Tyrannosaurus Rex has stayed and is now part of the new development on the site. So the USS Constitution is the oldest commissioned ship in the US Navy. It was launched in 1797 and she earned the nickname Old Ironsides in the War of 1812 when enemy cannonballs appeared to bounce off her thick oak hull. <laughs> I was gonna say skull, her hull. Um, the Constitution was retired from active service in 1881 and today hangs out at the former Charlestown Navy Yard. It's open for public tours, and here are tourists back in around 1930, lining up to get a view of the old ship. The fake ship is the old Ship's Haven restaurant, which opened in Linfield around 1930. Customers would cross a gangplank to enter the nautical-themed dining spot, and the restaurant claimed its portholes were as authentic as anything used in a real ocean liner. Um, it was eventually known just as the ship and it closed and was demolished in 2017. So here's a little bit of Route 1 in Boston. Um, on the left is the Tobin Bridge, officially the Maurice J. Tobin Memorial Bridge which opened in 1950 and of course spans the Mystic River between the city of Chelsea and the Charlestown neighborhood of Boston. The Tobin brings Route 1 into Boston or out of Boston. And um, through Boston, the highway travels concurrently with I-93 and Massachusetts 3. The bridge played a supporting role in the book and the movie Mystic River. And I'm sure many of you remember when notorious murderer Charles Stewart jumped off the Tobin to his death in 1990. On the right, you see the central artery under construction in downtown Boston next to the old um, Custom House Tower. Well, it's still the Custom House Tower. Um, the official name of the central artery, of course, was the John F. Fitzgerald Expressway and it was an elevated highway that also opened in 1950. And as I said, carried I-93, US-1, and Massachusetts-3 through downtown Boston. The highway couldn't handle the growing tra traffic congestion and the elevated roadway was replaced with an underground highway as part of the complex and costly construction project that we all fondly remember as the Big Dig. The old structure was dismantled in 2004. So one of the things I loved was finding connections between these landmarks along Route 1 that were really miles apart. The Battle of Bunker Hill was fought on Breed's Hill in Charlestown on June 17, 1775. The British won that battle, but the revolutionary soldiers held their own. And then 50 years later, war hero Marquis de Lafayette laid the cornerstone for the Bunker Hill Monument, which was a rare celebration of an American military defeat. So where did Lafayette stay? Whoops, sorry about that. Where did Lafayette stay when he was on his visit to Massachusetts? Supposedly, he spent a night in Foxboro at the Everett Inn, which is shown on the lower left here, um, which was eventually renamed the Lafayette House in his honor. George Washington and Ben Franklin are also said to have been guests of the establishment. And that candy shop? On the right, Putnam Pantry in Danvers has been owned by the Emerson family since 1951. The Emersons are direct descendants of General Israel Putnam, 
who fought at the Battle of Bunker Hill. And he is popularly credited with telling the revolutionary troops, don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes, although that story has possibly been debunked, but it lives on. So before Gillette Stadium, Bay State Raceway was a harness racetrack in Foxborough. The track opened in 1947 and pretty routinely packed in 10,000 people a night at its peak. But unfortunately for the racetrack and the horses, the New England Patriots wanted the property for their new stadium. So the racetrack, which by then was known as Foxborough Park, was torn down in 2000 to make way for Gillette Stadium. And the horses moved five miles south on Route 1 to Plainville, where they set up shop as the Plain Ridge Race Course, which is now known as the Plain Ridge Park Casino. So speaking of Plainville, Cowboy Town was the Wild West theme park on Route 1 in Plainville from 1957 to 1960. Here we have a picture of the Cowboy Town stagecoach making a promotional appearance at Fenway Park in Boston. And this creepy clown here, he was part of an amusement park called Funland in North Attleboro. Um, originally, there was a small dairy bar called Jolly Chollies that opened up on Route 1. And then that was expanded a little bit. The menu expanded and the owners hired roller skating car hops. And suddenly it was like American graffiti in North Attleboro. Um, but in 1959, the owners added on this amusement park called Funland and tried to create family-friendly entertainment on their property as well. Um, Jolly Charlie's was sold in 1972, and I don't know what happened to this clown. So let's go to New Hampshire. So the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, also known as the Portsmouth Navy Yard, was established in 1800, 1800. And it's the US Navy's oldest continuously operating shipyard. However, despite its name, the facility is not in Portsmouth and it's not even in New Hampshire, but it's part of Kittery, Maine. The Naval Yard produced its first battleship in 1814 and workers built and repaired vessels for pretty much the next hundred years. And then the shipyard began to manufacture submarines in the early 20th century. And during World War II, it built more than 70 subs. This is a 1941 view of the Navy Yard and you can see Route 1 in the foreground. This submarine shown here, this is the USS Albacore. It was a US Navy test submarine and was built at the Portsmouth Navy Yard and was commissioned in 1953. After almost two decades serving as a floating laboratory, she was decommissioned in 1972 and ended up in Philadelphia but the Albacore returned to New Hampshire in 1985 and now operates as a museum in Portsmouth. So Howard Johnson's is pretty much synonymous with road travel in, um, in the US, especially um, mid-century road travel. Um, this is the Portsmouth Howard Johnson's on the left and it was moved in 1945 no, 1949, excuse me, to accommodate construction of the Portsmouth traffic, traffic circle. On the right is Yokins in Portsmouth. In 1947, Harry Yokin opened a restaurant in Portsmouth and by 1972, Yokins had seating for 500 customers and served 500,000 meals a year. The restaurant closed in 2004 and the building was torn down but a few local businesses stepped up to restore and relight the beloved Thar She Blows sign, and that's still standing on Route 1 and blows every night. Two exhibits invite visitors to explore the complicated history of Portsmouth. Strawberry Bank is a 10-acre campus with historic houses and costume role players. 
This is Studley's Tavern, which dates to 1761. And in the 1760s, James Studley hosted auctions in his building, selling rum, cotton, and enslaved Africans. A decade later, Studley's became a meeting place for American revolutionaries and even Paul Revere paid a visit in 1774. On the right, you see um, a marker from the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire, which is designed to promote awareness and appreciation of African-American history and culture in the state. In 2003, construction workers were digging under Chestnut Street in Portsmouth and they found 13 wooden coffins. Eventually, it was determined that nearly 200 freed and enslaved African people were buried at the site in the 18th century. So the city closed Chestnut Street and created a memorial park known as the African Burying Ground. So the Clamshell Alliance was a grassroots organization formed in 1976 to protest the construction of the Seabrook nuclear power plant. On May 1st, 1977, the Alliance staged a civil disobedience event and more than 2,000 protesters occupied the construction site. And more than 1,400 of them were arrested. Seabrook Station, which is the current name of the site, is still in operation today. <coughs> But the, the citizen actions did have their impact. A second reactor was never built and the original owner of the nuclear plant went bankrupt a few years after it opened. So the World War II Memorial Bridge, hmm, sorry, carried Route 1 across the Piscataqua River between New Hampshire and Maine. The bridge opened in 1923 and was replaced 90 years later. And here you see that girl in the front. She was Eileen Foley. She was five years old in that picture. And she grew up to be an eight term mayor of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And coming full circle, she dedicated the replacement bridge in 2013. So now let's look at route one in Maine. So this is one of my favorite stories. Members of a social club in Presque Isle purchased a standard bred horse named John R. Braden in 1921 for about $4,000. The trotter competed in Maine and the Canadian Maritimes and he was almost impossible to beat. He was kind of like the sea biscuit of Northern Maine. He was nicknamed the Little Iron Horse. People wrote songs about him. People wrote poems about him. And John R. Braden earned about $48,000 during his racing career. The Northeast Land Hotel in Presque Isle was the scene of one of John R. Braden's most famous off-track exploits. In 1921, in October, guests gathered at the hotel to celebrate his success after his first racing year. Supposedly, they led the horse inside and depending on who you believe, served him oats or champagne in a silver bowl. He survived and went on to race for another six years and died in 1929 at the age of 17. But the story doesn't end there. In 1950, a new movie theater opened on Route 1 in Presque Isle and it was named after John R. Braden, Presque Isle's favorite equine. So lobster fishing is one of the largest and probably the most visible parts of Maine's economy. In 2021, the Maine lobster catch was 108 million pounds and it was worth a record high $725 million. The industry employs about 4,000 people directly and thousands more work in related businesses. In Arusta County, Farmers began growing potatoes in the early 1800s, but it really was the arrival of the Bangor and Aroostook Railroad at the end of the 19th century that brought Maine potatoes to the world. And by the 1940s, Maine led the United States in potato production, 
and the red, white, and blue, I know this is black and white, but the red, white, and blue freight cars were a familiar sight. And this picture on the right, these are schoolgirls brandishing potatoes um, as part of the 1940 potato barrel rolling contest in Presque Isle. One of my favorite pictures. So this is Big Jim. Big Jim is a 40 foot tall sign who originally was in Kittery and originally was carrying a sardine can that read Maine sardines welcome you to vacation land and sardine land. Eventually he was moved to Stinson Seafoods in Prospect Harbor, um, which was a sardine cannery. But when Stinson closed and left Maine without any sardine factories, a lobster processor took over the plant and swapped out the sardine can for the lobster trap. But in Jonesport, the Maine Coast Sardine History Museum documents the state's sardine industry. Um, and there's what I like to call Little Jim on their wall. Um, the quirky museum reflects the vision of Ronnie and Mary Peabody, who collected sardine memorabilia for years and they built the museum next to their home in 2005. During World War II, about 3,500 German prisoners of war were housed at Camp Holton in Holton, Holton, Maine. Many of those POWs worked at local farms where they picked and planted potatoes and other crops. They also took advantage of the camp's art program and some of, the, some of their paintings like this one are on display at the um, Arista County Historical and Art Museum in Holton. On the lower right, that's the Maine State Prison, the old Maine State Prison. It was built in 1824 in Thomaston and prisoners often worked in the town's limestone quarry. The prison closed in 2002 and was demolished. And on the site today, is the Maine State Prison Showroom, which sells everything from furniture to cornhole boards handcrafted by inmates in the state prison system. The Casco Bay Trading Post opened in South Freeport in 1947. And this 30 foot statue, which is sometimes known as Chief Passamaquoddy, sometimes known as the Big F Indian, supposedly the F stands for Freeport, um, was installed in 1969. The statue has become a little controversial recently because of its perceived cultural insensitivity and its future is unknown. The trading post itself closed in 1989. And on the right, of course, that's the bootmobile. Um, Leon Leonwood Bean, returned from a 1911 hunting trip with wet feet and an idea for a new kind of hunting boot. Once he got the design perfected, he opened the first L.L. Bean store on Main Street in Freeport. Today, a giant hunting boot stands outside the flagship store and the bootmobile is parked nearby, ready to roll. So Main, sort of has a desert. The desert of Maine is a very strange place. It's in Freeport. It has sand, but it's not a desert. It was created when glaciers deposited sandy silt across southern Maine, which eventually got covered with topsoil and eventually was suitable for agriculture. So in the 1700s, a farmer named William Tuttle began working his 300 acres. Unfortunately, Future generations made some very bad land management decisions and the topsoil eroded and the sand began to emerge. Eventually, the sand covered 40 acres of the farm and the family abandoned their farmland. A visionary promoter bought the land in 1919 and turned it into a tourist attraction in 1925, targeting the new auto traffic on Route 1. And the best part is he brought in live camels. Today, those camels are fiberglass and the desert of Maine offers tours, trails and family friendly activities. So 
So starting in the 1930s, Maine cities and towns had festivals to celebrate pretty much everything from potato blossoms to lobsters. And most of those festivals crowned a queen. So on the left, you see um, contestants vying for the title of alewife queen in 1957 and um, in Damascata Mills. Um, the alewife is not just a stop on the red line. It's a type of herring that migrates from the ocean to spawn in freshwater lakes. In the middle is Belfast. Poultry was big business in Waldo County and Maine Broiler Day was established in 1948 for industry leaders to get together in Belfast. And in 1949, Maine Governor Frederick Payne crowned Betty Perry, the first broiler queen. Broiler Day gradually evolved from a trade meeting to a community event known as the Maine Broiler Festival. But when the area's two major poultry, poultry plants closed in the 1980s, the Broiler Festival was renamed the Bay Festival. And here's the Agunquit Playhouse in Agunquit. Um, the Playhouse opened in 1933 and the Summer Stock Theater attracted stars from stage and screen. The Playhouse moved to its current location on Route 1 in 1937. The theater transitioned to nonprofit status in the 1990s and continues to produce new and classic musicals. So let me wrap up. I want to talk about, um, with a quote, I want to quote, photographer Bernice Abbott, who traveled the entire length of Route 1 in 1954. She shot 2,400 black and white photographs, about one image per mile. And she wrote about her travels. She said, we wanted to capture visually the character of an historic section of the United States, its beauties and incongruities and all. If, visit if visible evidences of the past survive, we wanted to photograph them before bulldozers and derricks moved in. And I think her words still ring true today. So I will wrap up with this lovely photo in Fort Kent and um, turn it back to Robert. But I hope you all want to share your favorite memories of Route 1 during the Q&A. So thank you, everyone. So thank you, Susan. Wonderful job. Uh, folks, let's take uh, 15 minutes of audience questions and comments. Uh, if we do not get to your question, uh, you can see that up here on the screen, uh, Susan has provided her contact information, uh, including her email address, her website, and her social media accounts. But if you have any questions, please get them into the Q&A. If you have any comments, please get them into the chat. And as Susan said, if you want to share some of your favorite memories of Route 1, uh, feel free to type those into the chat. Let me fix my mind. All right. So an anonymous attendee asks, how did each state's highway department regulate the curb cuts off of Route 1? For He asks, or she asks, because in some places they are well spaced, but in other places like Saugus, they are dangerously close which made exiting onto Route 1 an adventure. I agree exiting onto Route 1 is an adventure in Saugus, but I have no idea how it's regulated. I think that would be a question for MassDOP. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul, our old pal Paul asks, uh, with the Naval Yard located in Maine, why was it named the Portsmouth Naval Yard? That's a good question. Um, the border between Maine and New Hampshire was in dispute for many, many, many years, and it eventually landed in the Supreme Court. So I think um, I think I don't really know beyond that. I know that um, I know that New Hampshire wanted the Navy Yard to be part of. New Hampshire, and I don't know why it was named Portsmouth. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, how did Route 1 become the, quote, King's Highway? 
I'm not sure I know what that means. I'm going to look that one up. Uh, I have so a question I can answer. Well, we're going to get to them. Here we go. So an anonymous attendee asks, what town is the Moody Diner and Cabins located in Maine? Waldoboro. All right, there you go. Yay. Uh, Mary asks, is Flo's hot dog place on Route 1? Does if that it ring is, a bell? It's nothing I encountered. So uh, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, it's nothing I saw. It may be there and I don't know about it, but I'm not familiar with it. Yeah, we don't expect you to know every single, uh, <laughs> you know, attraction along Route 1. But uh, uh, Bruce says that, um, oh, my buddy Bruce from Chumpsford, who puts on some great uh, presentations, uh, says that, yes, Flows is on Route 1 in York, Maine. Ah, okay. Uh, Emily says it's south of Ngunkwit. Okay. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Um, okay, great. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, can you provide input regarding antique shops and sales uh, along Route 1? You know, that's a funny question because most of when I've been driving along Route 1, I've been doing research for the book. And it drives me crazy that I cannot stop and go shopping at these antique stores. So sadly, I have no recommendations, but I'm going back in July and I hope to figure things out. Uh, Deborah would like to know if Jolly Charlie, I'm going to get this wrong, Jolly, Jolly Charlie. Charlie in North Attleboro, does that get a mention in your book? Yes. Right. Yes, that's that clown. That was that, you want me to go back to that slide? That was that, um, oh, it's gonna take a while to get back to that slide. It, that, yeah, it's up to you. <laughs> that was that slide in North, the clown in North Attleboro, there he is. So you only see the top of the clown, but he actually was full size and, and formed the entrance to Funland and you had to kind of walk underneath him, his legs formed an arch at the entrance to the park. Well, I'm glad I'm not the only clown on this call. Uh, Mike asks, does Route 1 now extend to the Canadian border? Where does Route 1 stop? Um, it starts and stops depending on which way you're looking. Um, in Fort Kent in Maine, which is at the Canadian border at the St. John River. Mm -hmm. uh, an anonymous attendee wants to know what was the scandalous book uh, you referenced a pain place I think you kind of hint, hinted at it at the beginning of your talk uh, um, can, you, well, can you tell us about the scandal there <laughs> well the book was called Peyton place oh there you go um, it was set in a fictional town in New Hampshire and it was about you know small town life but I, I haven't read the book. I've only seen the movie. And, you know, it was a TV show in the, what, 60s with Ryan O'Neill um, and Mia Farrow, I think. Oh. Um, and I'm oh, sorry, this light is not right there. Um, and in the movie, there's, you know, there are scenes of, um, you know, domestic abuse there's an abortion, there's teenage pregnancy, there's all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. which, you know, in the 50s was very, very, very scandalous. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Carol Grace, asks- Grace Metalios was the author. I'm not sure, I, I'd have to look it up to see how to spell it. Gotcha. Uh, do you know if Route 1 follows any old Native American trails? I know that there are native um, there is a Native American presence all along Route One. I'm not sure it follows any trails in particular, but there are uh, five recognized Native American tribes in Maine, and all of them have a little bit of a presence on Route One. Uh, anonymous attendee asks, "Do you, do you have a personal favorite section of Route One?" I like Belfast. 
Um, I only talked a little bit about Belfast here in the presentation, um, but Belfast has some very um, cool stuff. It has, um, it has this place called Perry's Nut House, which um, was originally opened in the 40s, I think. And it sold, you know, like exotic nuts and, you know, pecans and Brazil nuts and blah, blah, blah. But the owner also had a penchant for collecting exotica. So there was, you know, a giant man-eating clam. And um, there is still a stuffed albatross, a taxidermied albatross there. And all sorts of crazy stuff there. And Eleanor Roosevelt stopped there. Um, so, and on the front, on the front lawn, there are all these sculptures of animals. And then at some point it was sold, the animals were auctioned off. And then there was an elephant that was purchased by the Colonial Theater in downtown Belfast, and it was installed on their roof. And um, I believe his name is Hawthorne, perhaps the... Um, person from Belfast can confirm that. So uh, Joy uh, writes, did Route 1 start as a mail route between the colonies? And someone else asks, was Route 1 a main path for horses and carriages from Boston to Northern Maine during the revolutionary days? You know, I didn't really go into the revolutionary history of Route 1, except for some of those battles. Um, I mostly focused on the road from 1926 onward. Um, I suspect some of these were carriage paths. I know that, for example, um, that Lafayette House in um, Foxborough was part of a stagecoach route. I know that there was a stagecoach route that went through um, Callis, Maine. So um, certainly there were pieces of it. I know that Route 1 connected the old Atlantic Coast Highway for the most part, but I would have to do more research about um, colonial paths. All right, so uh, I'm going to jump into the chat now, um, Susan, where there's lots of comments and questions. Uh, we won't get to all of them. Uh, Joel uh, notes that uh, Kings Highway in Connecticut, uh, a portion of that uh, was also Route 1, so that might be uh, what was referenced in the uh, one of the first questions I asked you. So Kings Highway in Connecticut was also uh, a portion of Route 1. Um, let me see here. Uh, Joel says Payton's Place um, was based uh, uh, in uh, Gilmanton Ironworks, New Hampshire. Uh, so Elaine says, absolutely wonderful presentation. It brought back so many memories of Route 1. Karen says, excellent presentation. Christine notes that uh, she grew up on Route 1 in Saugus. My father ran the Carvel ice cream stand for many years wow. next to the Dino Mini Golf. Cool. Uh, let's see here. We've answered Joy's question. Mike says, thank you for an interesting presentation. So many great memories. Uh, Doug says, Route 1 was a big part of my childhood as a travel route to my grandparents in East Boston. It still pains me that the cactus is defaced with a Starbucks sign. Uh, let's see, Abby says that Howard Johnson in Danvers along Route 95, uh, parts of original Route 1, uh, is one of her favorite memories. Um, let's see here. Uh, Valeria, apologize for any mispronunciations. Uh, she writes, when I got my driver's license, the first place I headed was Route 1. From where I lived in Swampskit, it was one place you could only go, only get to by car. No buses actually ran there from, from Lynn. Um, it, can be, it can still be very stressful pulling into Route 1 traffic. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. Yes, I agree. Uh, uh, Deborah says, I grew up going to the drive-in Revere just off of Route 1 in Revere, it was so much fun. And Deborah asks, uh, is the drive-in uh, mentioned in your book? Um, no. <laughs> is okay. that a drive-in theater or like a drive-in restaurant? I'm assuming it was a theater, but it yeah. was uh, in Revere. So uh, Deborah, if you have any additional information, let us know. 
uh, more context. Uh, Frank says, fascinating presentation. Uh, Abby says, how about the amusement park in Newberry? Is there an amusement park in Newberry? Um, I believe there was. Um, I It's not in the book, but I believe it was owned or promoted by the same um, person who owned Cowboy Town. I think he had a few yes. themed mm -hmm. amusement parks. Uh, Sharon says that Flo's Hot Dogs is actually in Cape Netic, Maine. Okay, so we've got Cape dueling Netic fact is checks part of, going. Cape yep. Netic is part of York. So yeah, that's all oh. consistent. Yeah. Uh, Judy says, thank you. I enjoyed this presentation. Kat uh, confirms what you said. A uh, Peyton Place TV show was the first nighttime soap opera. It starred uh, Mia Farrow and uh, Ryan O'Neill, who were unknown uh, actors before it aired. Uh, let me see here. Uh, Diane notes that the book Peyton Place was controversial because the author depicted actual people and in incidents from the town she was living in, and the townspeople were not pleased. Ah, uh, yes. So we're winding down here. Uh, Heidi says, uh, where can someone find photographs that Bernice Abbott took when she traveled Route 1? Is there any sort of photo book for sale? You know, I've been trying to find that myself. Um, there have been occasional exhibitions, but there hasn't been one lately. Um, there's a gap, and, and what's interesting also is Bernice Abbott retired to a small town in Maine mm -hmm. and sort of toward the end of her life just took photos locally in Maine. And there's a gallery in Ellsworth that represents some of those photos, but those are not Route 1 photos. Mm -hmm. um, her Route 1 photos are hard to find. Um, I've, I've sort of checked with some galleries and, and they're hard to find. Uh, so in the chat, Deborah confirms that the drive-in was a movie theater. It had a playground, a food stand, and it showed double features. Uh, and then Linda confirms in the chat that it was uh, the the Newberry uh, uh, theme park was called Adventureland. Okay. Uh, Marriott says this, this was lots of fun. Thank you. Kathy said, I really enjoyed the presentation. It was a flashback to so many landmarks of things I remembered. It was great to hear the backstory of so many of these places. I love the Yokins whale sign and very happy to see it brought back. And I loved going to the uh, Kowloon and the Hilltop. Uh, Cheryl says, thanks for this information. Uh, Jeff notes that in Waldeboro, Maine, a famous stop was a Route 1 takeout shack offering Red's Hots, which was bright red colored hot dogs. Ooh. Have you heard of that before? <laughs> I have not. I thought uh, Red Hops were, I don't know, some, not in Maine. I thought they were a delicacy from somewhere else, but maybe not. Yeah. Uh, Shelly says, I grew up in Revere. I practically, practically lived on Route 1 uh, restaurants up and down Massachusetts. I especially miss the Hilltop. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, this is kind of a really tricky question from a vet, but she's asked it twice. So let me ask you, okay. what do you think is the average distance between um, sites, sites worth seeing? What, what is the average distance? I, I, that, that's a hard question because, you know, in, in, in Arusta County, way up north by Presque Isle and Fort Kent, everything is far apart. The towns are far apart, and there's just you know miles of forest between them. Um, and then you get to like York and Agunquid and Wells, and things are you know kind of chock a block. So I, I don't think there's a good answer to that. It kind of depends where you are. Susan, we're coming close to eight o'clock. Okay, to go five more minutes. Oh sure. My dog's being you're, you're, very uh, good. Kodak's doing okay over there? Kodak's doing great. All right. Uh, Mike knows the Trolley Museum on Route 1 in Maine uh, makes for a great day trip. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, do you know when the Topsfield Fair on Route 1 began? Yes. Um, 
it began as the, I think, Essex County Agricultural um, Fair, something like that in the early, in like around 1818, there was, and they had their first like cattle show or something in around 1820. But it didn't settle in as the Topsfield Fair in actual Topsfield. Um, it bounced around Essex County for about 100 years. I think in around 1910, it settled in Topsfield. But I would, it's in the book. I'd have to confirm those dates. But I think that's about when it was. Uh, Jane in the chat says it's the oldest fair in the country. And um, Shelley says the Topsfield Fair started with cattle and then the 4-H club. Uh, okay. Susan says near and across from Kowloon's was a place called Puppy Haven. Ooh. I used to beg my parents to stop there and I would beg my parents to let me get a dog, but they never did. Oh. I'm sorry, Susan. Uh, anonymous attendee says this was totally delightful. I uh, did uh, mini golf with a dinosaur many times. Uh, my dad almost uh, got knocked out once uh, while golfing there. Uh, there used to be puppies for sale outside of a house on Route 1 uh, in the Saugus Danvers areas uh, area for many years. Uh, this was a fabulous presentation. Uh, we already answered the question about Bernice Abbott. Mike wants to know, how far south have you traveled on Route 1? Hmm. Well, for this book, um, Attleboro, but um, in, in real life, I mean, I've been to Miami. <laughs> but have I traveled it continuously? No. Uh, Lynette asks, what can you tell us about the rerouting of Route 1 through Newburyport? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't really have specifics on that. I know that one of the reasons the mileage varies so much with different estimates is because of things like rerouting and detours and business, you know, business one and route, you know, so, but yeah, I, I don't really know the answer to that specifically. I'm sure this person is just asking for a friend, Susan, uh -oh. uh, but an anonymous attendee asks, are there or were there any strip clubs or racy clubs or bars along Route 1? Well, yeah, there was the Golden Banana. <laughs> um, in, where was that, Saugus? I'm not sure. Um, that was a strip club, right? Um, I, I wouldn't know, Susan. I, I wouldn't I, know. I, I, I've heard, I've heard. I'll take, um, I'll take your word for it. There Do any of those uh, types of attractions make uh, make your book? You know, I wanted to include that one, but I honestly, there was like no information about it. So I, I just, and, and no photos. So I, I, it ended up not being in the book. Um, right. There was I'm a told, jazz I'm club. Told, uh, the golden banana is in Peabody is, from, okay. is what I'm told. So okay. but let, let's change the subject, Susan. Uh, is uh, an anonymous attendee asks about where's beach in relation to route one is, is where's beach on route one? No, where's beach is on um, US three in Laconia, New Hampshire. Uh, Not even anonymous close. Attendee, uh, well, uh, uh, this is the last reference to golden banana. Uh, anonymous attendee says, I was shocked when a date took me to the Golden Banana <laughs> and I shouted out, they're all naked. <laughs> um, anonymous attendee says, the Jolly Cholly's clown sign was and always will be creepy to me. I think it makes sense now why when I was a kid, I developed clown phobia. What kid would want to walk through a clown's leg to enter the park? It was <laughs> creepy. Yeah. And we're going we're gonna to wrap up with these four comments. Um, Jane says, great presentation. Uh, I live in Danvers. My first job was at Putnam Pantry on the southbound side of Route 1. Pat uh -huh. says, I live, I live near Route 1 in New Jersey and also in Virginia. It looks the same with lots of chains and some fun local businesses. 
Uh, Joel has a great comment uh, on Route 1 in Saugus, or maybe Linfield, was Lenny's on the Turnpike, which yes. was a jazz and pop music venue that had national acts, including Paul Butterfield and Miles Davis. Did that one happen to make your book? It made my book and it almost made this presentation tonight, but I was worried about time. Um, Lenny's on the Turnpike was a jazz club and you know, Duke Ellington played there and um, Buddy Rich and um, really it, it attracted all the, you know, national level jazz um, luminaries played there. And then one night it burned down and it never opened again. on each side of the highway. And uh, Jeff notes that Jay Leno uh, performed at Lenny's on the Turnpike in Linfield. So I think we got through all comments and questions and we did wow. it in less than uh, 25 minutes. So wow. that's good enough for me, folks. Let's give Susan a big virtual round of applause for a wonderful presentation. Uh, Susan, I'll circle back to you in about 30 seconds. Uh, but okay. just as a reminder, folks, you'll receive an email from me tomorrow with this recording, with the feedback survey, with information about some other upcoming virtual programs that might be of interest, with a link to purchase an autographed copy uh, of Susan's book. Uh, and also, I'm going to thank all 15 partnering libraries. And in addition to that, I'm going to give you information about my libraries adult summer reading program, and you do not need to live in Tewksbury to participate. You can live out of town, you can even live out of state. All right, so we're really pushing that, okay? I wanna get a thousand summer reading program participants. That is my goal. Uh, so Susan, any last words before we wrap it up? Well, thank you. Um, this was a lot of fun. And as I said, this was my, inaugural presentation about this book so if there were any little kinks in it forgive me um they will be ironed out and um thank you so much it was a great presentation great audience great questions and um i had a lot of fun and my dog was a good boy Kodak was a very good boy so thank you very much susan thank you to kodak thank you all for watching and uh, we'll see you next time. Have a good night. Thanks.